Hello there, welcome everyone. Today I want to tell you the story of my first job as a software developer. Hi, my name is Marco and I'm a full stack developer working from home. Now, I just wanted to give you a bit of a disclaimer at the beginning. Now, the overall experience of this first job was terrible, to be totally honest, but I don't want you to get this video and be discouraged by it, absolutely. On the contrary, uh, the message of this video wants to be like, if you think you're not good enough, if you think you're not there yet, that is just overthinking. Just stop it right now, that is not true and these experience prove it. Of course, you're gonna have some experience similar to this, but uh, believe me, you are good enough. That is just overthinking. That is just the imposter syndrome talking. So stop it right now, believe in yourself, and believe me, the reality is actually way worse than you can imagine. This being said, let me just give you a bit of a backstory here. So. I am a full stack developer. I'm totally self-taught. I learn how to code uh, basically online with YouTube and uh, online courses. I don't have any computer science degree. I didn't have any bootcamp degree or anything. I just learned by myself, basically. Overall, it took me almost one and a half years to find my first job. But to be totally honest, uh, for the first like six to eight months, I wasn't even looking for a job because I was learning. I didn't really feel I could offer something useful. So realistically, it took me, yeah, a year, one year to find my first job, which I gotta say, it, it's fine. I mean, it, it sounds like a long time, but I think it was the time, the right time for me because I was confident enough to be, you know, to do interviews and to finally have a job. So the job was as a back-end engineer using Python. Uh, we were using Django to build a product that is basically a CMS, which is a content management system. And the closest example I can give you is WordPress. Basically, you could create websites, you could create pages and the PDF contracts. Now, as I said before, the overall experience of this first job was absolutely terrible. And of course, there are some subjective things like uh, I had to go to the office which is something I hate and that is personal of course but there are also some objective things like facts and the first one is that so the product uh, has been going on for like 10 years I think 8 to 10 years so you can imagine the code base is like gigantic huge so you would imagine that you have a very dedicated team, big dedicated team behind it. Well, it wasn't. It, are, it actually was a very small team. And when I say small, I mean three people, <laughs> me included, okay? So there was the senior, there was the mid-level, and there was me, which, you know, I was the junior, of course. That, of course, means a lot of stuff because there was there, are, there were many things to do. I mean, the code base was huge. And uh, probably the biggest problem was that there was no testing. We didn't test anything. Written in the code, there was nothing at all. And I mean, for a project, for a product of this size, you would have, you would want uh, an entire team dedicated to testing. Well, there was nothing. And this created like a lot of bugs, a lot of small problems. Now, don't get me wrong, all code has bugs. You, you're gonna have it. That's just the way it is. And that's fine, absolutely. But there are so many small things that you can avoid and, you know, catch before they go into production that can save you a lot of work just by testing, properly testing the product. We weren't doing it. And this actually resulted in something, a big waste of time. Just to give you an example, I remember fixing some bugs of some features that were basically broken and they had been broken for for years from the first time they were implemented basically they never worked and to me that was quite shocking because i gotta tell you i started wondering you know how do you decide which feature to implement and the answer was there was one guy the manager and he was deciding the features basically and believe me i wanted to learn something from this job but definitely I didn't want to learn that because that is such a 
bad practice. When you're creating a product and you're making it for like the user, the end user, you should have the end user in mind. So who cares what feature you want to implement? What matters is what the user you know, might want. Well, it turns out that there was no user feedback. We didn't have any kind of metrics, any kind of analytics. We had no idea what the users using the product were saying about the product itself. And so the whole project was basically an over-engineered mess. There were feature left and right. Some of, the, some of those were broken and they never worked, but nobody ever asked for that. If you ask me, that is <laughs> unacceptable because let's face it, I mean, just to give you an example, we had a very kind of long sprint. Let's call it sprint. There was nothing such a, a sprint. It wasn't like the agile methodology. Th there was nothing about that company, about that product it was agile. But we had like a couple of weeks working on permissions. Now, permissions is a complicated topic. They are quite complex and they're very important to get right because, I mean, if you get it wrong, you're basically, you know, giving permissions to somebody who shouldn't. So you want to be careful with that. You want to have a lot of testing behind it. We didn't, but the fact is that the way we were implementing permissions was absolutely atrocious. It was really over-engineered. I mean, the thing is that you want permissions, which is already complicated, to be as simple as possible, as straightforward as possible. As possible. Now, if you think of like a project structure and you want to think about it as a, as a tree, but uh, yeah, like an upside down tree, so the root and then all the branches and leaf. Well, you basically have all the nodes and you want to set the permissions to each node. So I say that you have permission on this node but not on this one. This means that all the branches and leaves from this node, well, you cannot access to it. We weren't doing that. We were actually providing like a permission. I could deny the permission on this node, but you could have a permission on one of its children, on one of its leaves. And so you had to recursively check all the different leaves Basically, you had always to go the full depth of the tree, check permissions, and consider that we had like three different types of permissions, like company and group and, and uh, individual user. And that was just a nightmare. It's super inefficient. And the worst thing about this is that nobody ever asked for such a feature. Nobody. It's not like, oh, well, they, they, the user said that they like to deny a permission for this folder, but not for these children. So for this child. So we need to account for that. We need to create something. Nobody ever asked. One other thing that really kind of shocked me, it was quite disappointing, is the fact that it was, uh, they, they really had a very old kind of mentality. It wasn't really modern, it wasn't really up to date, and they were using quite like ancient technology. Not ancient, but they weren't using like the latest technology even for something very useful. I remember one time I suggested, I hinted to the fact that we could use AWS services to do some stuff, especially when it comes to database. Uh, we were doing basically everything with the file system. And I said, you know what, would be more efficient, you know, AWS. They had some cool feature for, for databases and data analysis and when not, even analytics, something. Okay. And they were just like, uh, nah, nah, thanks, uh, I'm good, we're good. Okay, that made me realize that actually for my personal project, and remember, I was a junior, for my personal project, I was actually using more technologies than they were using it for a, like, a production level product. Another thing that uh, kind of put me off uh, in that company was that there was no company culture at all. Now. Some of you might say that, I mean, who cares about company culture? It's just a bunch of bullshit and that's fine. But look, when you have a company, I want to know what is your deal? You know, what are you doing this for? Is it, is it for, for giving value to, to, to the user? Is it for making money? Is it for, I don't know, having fun? To me, it looked like, I don't know, when you're building something, you know, the Lego bricks, okay. 
So I have a Lego brick right here and I can imagine to build a battleship with it. I already have the final picture in mind. So I stack the pieces so that I can, you know, create that battleship. What I was looking, what I was seeing there at that company was almost like they had a brick of Lego, you know, and they were just stacking piece by piece, one upon the other, but there was no final picture. It was just, yeah, let's stack everything together. We gonna make it as big as possible because big is bigger is cooler. That's what she said. In reality, you couldn't really figure out like, what's the point of this? And that's quite alarming, especially if you're working in there, because you want to have, or at least I want to have, like, a, a final picture in mind, an objective to, to follow, because otherwise, when you go to work, you're just typing things inside the computer, and that's, honestly, that's not fun. And this is actually one of the, the next point uh, that really pushed me away from this company and that was that I wouldn't use the product that I was making I wasn't at all satisfied by the product uh, the CMS the product was super complex super difficult it, it looked very old it felt very old it didn't have any kind of interesting feature for the user the user experience was terrible I mean I can tell you that I learned WordPress in completely almost in one week I worked at this company for six months and I didn't learn their CMS in those six months I couldn't just it was not intuitive at all and I was working on the code base I mean imagine how frustrating is that so you might ask well so what's the product I mean how's the user gonna buy it if 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 it's so terrible why is the user buying it well it turns out that uh, they didn't basically the user was usually a company it was never an individual it was a private company who was hiring another company to manage their content and this company was using their uh, this cms our product so in this second company, this intermediary, let's say, there were developers using our CMS to manage the content of the final company. And I can tell you guys that I've spoken with those people in the second company and they weren't at all satisfied by the product. They all had like complaints about it. It was super complex. The same thing that I was experiencing, I wasn't the only one. And the fact, the terrible fact is that we weren't doing anything about it because, as I said, we weren't receiving any feedback. So the features were just like, we're going to implement this. Okay, but who has? Nobody. So why are we doing this? I mean, you want to implement something that somebody asked. Things are broken for, for years. Nobody realized that. Why? Because nobody ever used it. But if nobody ever used it, it means that nobody ever asked and needed that feature. So why are we spending time implementing it? I remember the whole cycle was like, we had a meeting every week with the manager. He was the guy deciding. And he was super, you know, well-spoken and saying, hey, we're gonna develop this feature and that feature, that feature. And remember, I was the junior in there and I used to think, well, this sounds terrific, but do you realize that what you're saying it's basically, it's like we are a team of 20 people. We were actually a team of three people. So to me, it was like completely out of this world, out of reality. Maybe we can spend time listening to what the guys working on this product are saying that is lacking on about this and implement something in that direction. That might help. Why not? But no, I mean, the mentality was super old. It's what... Joshua Fluke would call like a boomer boss. That was the definition of a boomer boss. We've always done this way. You gotta, you know, be at the office and that's the way it is. I mean, <laughs> I'm out of here, really, I'm out of here. One last thing that I want to say about this experience is that um, when I first started, I was very keen on learning new things. And one of the things that I really wanted to see, you know, I had 
have been writing code for quite some time, one and a half years almost, and I want to compare how do I write code and what is the production level code that you can see in a company. Let me tell you that that code was absolutely terrible. It was terrible. You'll never see such a convoluted spaghetti code in your life. First of all, there were no comments, none nowhere to be found. You had thousands and thousands of lines of code. You had functions, even small functions. You had no idea what they were doing, but just a small description, like a doc string. Hey, this takes two integers and they add them up. Nothing. And you just had to figure it out while you, you were doing it. And usually with products of this size, you have what is called an internal wiki. So every time you do something, you update the wiki and for newcomers, you go to the wiki and read about the workflow, about the feature, about this and that. Their wiki was embarrassing. It was like, I don't know, something written by hand. It was nothing. I stopped using it after one week. It wasn't useful at all. And another thing about the code was that, and it, I mean, if you're a programmer and you've been coding for quite a while, you know what I mean. So Python, okay, you have a function. I remember seeing some functions that had, and I'm not joking, this is serious, 700, even more lines of code in one function. I mean, <laughs> that is impossible to follow. That is such a bad practice. Never, ever do that. There is some very basic principle, which is called the single responsibility principle when you're writing functions, which basically is one function should do one thing. Well, you didn't have that. You had this huge function without any comments, nowhere. It was doing like a million things, 800 lines of code, and you had to just figure it out piece by piece. And, you were like, and I was, what am I doing here? I can write better code than this. I could refactor this and break this into 10 other functions that would be way, way more readable. And that was a production level code. So if anything, as I said, the message of this video is don't get discouraged. I mean, you are probably writing better code than most of the companies out there. So if you really don't feel confident and sure, just stop it. That's overthinking. Try it. Believe me, try it. And of course, don't fall into the trap. I mean, try to keep your good habits. Uh, if they don't use it, as I did, uh, they didn't use it, but I didn't care because I wanted to be the best developer that I could be. So when I was doing something, I was updating the wiki regularly. I was commenting my code. I was writing doc strings, etc. I wasn't following them in their falsy, in their bad practices. And this is what you should do. This being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm really sorry for the rant, but hey, this was my first experience. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and share. And of course, as always, don't forget to subscribe. This will really help this channel grow and I'll see you at the next one. Ciao.